Hey everybody, it's Thursday night, 6 p.m., so you know what time it is. It's time for TDOC Talks. I'm Nasa Taylor, Director of Communication for the Tennessee Department of Correction, and today we have a very special guest. We have Mr. Tory Grimes, the department's legislative liaison. So welcome, Tory. Glad to be here. So this is your first time on the talks, the right? The first time. So how you feel? You good? Nervous, but I'll be okay. Don't be nervous. We're talking to friends, talking to Team TDOC, that's right? That's right, that's right. Okay, so you had a front row seat for everything that happened in Corridor Hall Building this year. So can you just walk us through kind of what all happened in the overview? Was it a hectic year? Was it a calm year? <laughs> it it, it, it was, was your first year. It was my first <laughs> year. Um, you, you know, I said I was kind of baptized by fire. Um, this was, uh, this was a, it was a very busy year. It started out at a breakneck pace. Um, and I think the idea was that it was, at least for the House members, it was an election year. So everybody wanted to get done quick so they could go out and campaign. It was the last year of the governor's uh, administration, uh, although things got strung out and we really didn't get out that early. <laughs> so uh, it was an exciting year, certainly a learning experience for me. You gonna come back and do it again next year? If, if they'll have me, I will. All right, great. So there were some really exciting things that took place this year. As we know, the governor kicked off his opioid initiative, really combating the opioid crisis in Tennessee. Was there any legislation related to that and to the department? Yeah, there, there, were, uh, there were actually a couple pieces of legislation and, and one in particular that we had a part of uh, for the Department of Correction and that was the opioid, um, the, the, the TCOM credit, the 60 day sentence credit for completion of that TCOM program. Um, and, and of course, that's the nine to 12 month intensive residential uh, treatment program that's it. And we dedicated uh, 512 beds at the West Tennessee State Prison, just so that the offenders that come into this program can essentially live, uh, eat, sleep, everything they do is with other offenders that are working on that same path. And we hope that that ends up being a very successful program. And that was a core piece of what we're doing in the prison system in Tennessee relative to the, the governors uh, uh, attacking this opioid problem. That's amazing. I know that Commissioner Parker has been really focused on substance abuse with the DRCs, with the, from the Public Safety Act, yes. to now this new facility over mm -hmm. in West 10. And then there's going to be an aftercare component to that as well throughout the state. So that's a huge piece that we're taking for this opioid initiative. It is. Also, the key thing that we have, everybody knows about the risk and needs assessments, been in play for a while now, and that we have the strong R. But a key part of the strong R is our criminal background checks. Not everybody understands that we do criminal background checks as a part of our risk and needs assessment. There's some legislation surrounding that as well. Yes, there is. We were, um, we were supporters and we actually got to assist the TBI on some legislation that they brought. And what that legislation does is it, it uh, ensured that the, a criminal case disposition actually was able to follow the offender through all the different stakeholders in the criminal justice process. And one of the huge problems that we saw as we started um, working through getting this information needed for the strong R was that an offender may have a criminal case that the disposition is not readily available because it's in some small county, it got either got dismissed, it got sentenced to diversion or something like that. And the, um, the case itself was never shown, di disposed of in NCIC. And that's a big issue and that's a big driver for us to accurately determine uh, what an offender's risk and or needs are in the whole grand scheme. So the TBI, uh, we worked with the, um, the, the court clerks and the courts and the AOC to develop a process. And so that process, it creates this number, an R84 control number. And that control number is gonna follow each, each case all the way through the system so that the TBI can make those appropriate matches back. And it was really gonna help us because that's gonna help us going forward uh, as far as to determine which, uh, what the final disposition of that case was. So a lot of collaboration went into that particular it, it, bill. It really did, it really did. Okay, great. So another thing that you may have heard about on the news was about safekeepers. And we've heard about a lot about safekeepers, about juvenile safekeepers. I know that you are an attorney by trade, so can you break down and tell us exactly what a safekeeper is? Sure, um, uh, there's a statute in Tennessee, it's, it's an older, so it's a really old statute. And what it does is if the local correctional facility the jail, really. The local jail can't uh, handle an inmate, whether it be for a medical need, a security need. The statute provides that the sheriff can go in front of the judge and the judge can 
issue a safekeeping order and in doing that can basically submit that inmate, commit that inmate to the Department of Correction custody. And um, there was a lot of issues in the press and, uh, and, and in the legislature this year because we had some juveniles who were not convicted of a crime uh, were committed to Department of Custody as safekeepers. Now they were being charged as adults, however they were still juveniles. And, uh, and I was lucky enough to get to work with the, uh, the, the majority leader in the Senate, worked real closely with him in drafting this legislation. And um, what this does is it, it essentially says that the court cannot commit a juvenile that's not been convicted of a crime to the Department of Correction any longer. Now obviously if that juvenile has, is convicted that's that's a different story but I think that makes a uh, it makes a huge difference for us and how we manage our facilities and how we maintain our compliance with ACA standards and PREA standards and state law and federal law. Um, the other thing that's really important is that even for adult safekeepers this legislation is going to require the courts to revisit their order every 30 days. Wow. So you know we don't create a situation where it's out of sight out of mind and the court is actually reviewing whether there is a continued need for this non-convicted person, an uh, unadjudicated case, to, to be committed to the Department of Correction. So we think that's a positive trend. Uh, we'll need to watch and see what happens next year if, if, if the legislature decides to take it a step further. But uh, I think it's a positive trend and we've gotten a lot of good feedback from it. And I know that we're working on policy too as well to make some changes to kind of align with that law and take it a little bit further as well. Exactly. Uh, we're working, I know our legal group is, is finalizing some policy right now to really do a semi or, or almost a, a thorough evaluation of that safekeeper, similar to the same way we do inmates on intake, to determine, okay, what kind of needs do they have? What, um, what security levels do they need to be at? What safety concerns are there? So I think that it, it's, it's, it's really kind of got the department to take a broader look and to really reevaluate this. Okay. So that's about safekeepers, but there's also some good news out there as well. It's a lot of technical stuff, but there's some reentry grants that are coming available soon. That, that's right, and, and, and this was not our legislation, but luckily uh, after it passed, we were able to work with the sponsors, and um, es essentially the department is will be making four grants of only $250,000 each to a local government, and it's really to drive reentry activity, to reduce recidivism. And, the, these are drived at those folks that are not committed to the Department of Correction custody. They're not coming to a state prison, at least not initially, but it's really to give them the services they need and or programming because programming at the local level is one of those issues that, quite frankly, there just hasn't been funding for it in the rural area. So this is really a pilot that we're going we're gonna to issue an RFI to our a request for information to the county governments because there may be some counties that are doing some really good things right. that we need to learn about. And, um, and then after we kind of get everything in order, we're going to issue a request for proposal to allow four counties to actually um, try, attempt to get these funds. And hopefully it does well, and hopefully that if we can show some good uh, evidence that this is working, the legislature will consider funding it in the future on a broader scale. So this is a pilot program that possibly could be extended if there's funding for it in the absolutely, future. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And, and it's, it's really unique for Tennessee. Uh, I know some other states have done something similar. And we're continuing to work with the sponsors of this legislation to, to figure out how we can all kind of come to the table and do a good job with it. Okay. And finally, so there was some legislation also affecting victims. I know mm -hmm. in the past, our victim services coordinator had to send snail mail to victims when they had to be notified of some changes. Yeah. But there's something in the works now to make it a little bit faster, it, right? It is. Um, and, and this is um, this was actually our legislation. It was part of the governor's package. And it really allows us to bring victim notification into the 21st century. Nowadays, people don't use snail mail. We use email. We use text. Um, so the, the, we had to actually change law to utilize these services because the law essentially contemplated really a snail mail process. So what, we, what the new system is going to allow, if you're a victim, or even if you're not a victim, you just have an interest um, on what happens to this particular offender uh, as they travel through the criminal justice system, you can sign up for email or text and see where that offender is, get that notification that the offender moves. And, and I think this is, a, this is a good system because as we know, you know, people move now, people change phone phone numbers, email address. This really lets the victim control what information they want, how they want it, um, and I think this is a win-win for everybody. Okay, so if people want to sign up for that, they can find out more about that on our website. So, 
It's your first time on TDLC Talks. You said you were nervous, but you nailed it. Good. Good. I'm glad. So you'll come back? Yes, I will come back. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for coming on today. And thank you all for watching. We will, of course, have more TDOC Talks in two weeks. You can catch us back here on Thursday at 6 p.m. Take care.